happy today to welcome and introduce to you Axel Buter. Axel Buter is one of Germany's leading color experts and researcher with a focus on color, light and space and the effect they have on human behavior, emotions and well-being. He's a professor of didactics of visual communication at the Faculty of Design and Art of the University of Wuppertal. He previously taught design fundamentals of color, light and space at the Borg uh, Gibbenstein University of Art and Design in Halle, Perceptual Psychology and Creativity at Hanover University of Applied Sciences, and Design and Design Theory at the University of Siegen. Since 2007, he has chaired the board of the German Color Association. After training as a stonemason and working as a restorer and stone sculptor, he went to study architecture at the Technical University Berlin, University of Arts Berlin and the Architectural Association London. He received his PhD from the University of Stuttgart on the subject of semiotics of visual space. In his design practice, Axel Buter realized numerous projects in the fields of architecture, exhibition design, scenography, and media art. Among them are, for example, Fortress Experience, a multimedia design experience exhibition in Dresden, and a media art installation, Izmir Mosaic at Port Izmir International Contemporary Art Triennale. Uh, his color design and development of a tile collection for Villeroy and Bach won him this year's Red Dot Award for product design. Axel Buter is a renowned speaker and the international, at the international conferences, and he makes color accessible through his popular science lectures, interviews, publications and radio broadcasts. Axel, welcome. The floor, or better said, screen is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mayam. A uh, very warm welcome from Germany. I'm talking from Wuppertal from my studio here. And I uh, like to ask you, um, I'm not doing uh, uh, in the presentation, but I'm just like to ask you uh, to use uh, the, the speaker mode. And you see uh, the picture of uh, uh, my portrait very large and uh, uh, the slides in the background even the same way. So I think I have a good mixture between my presence as a speaker and uh, the content I'm speaking about in this mode. So please try just to do the speaker mode. So I'm starting with the presentation and it's uh, for me it's quite seldom to do it uh, Sunday morning. So I think it's a very nice idea to do it with a cup of coffee and uh, invite people from all over the world. Um, I'm not uh, doing these uh, uh, lectures uh, um, very often, actually, in these uh, circumstances. Normally, it's more um, that you have a, a public which is uh, uh, more um, yeah, from one country and uh, from one uh, background. So um, I'm quite um, enjoying it, actually, to, to uh, speak today to a diverse, uh, actually, uh, audience. Um, I'm speaking about the secret power of colors. It's a popular book. It's a bestseller in Germany, but unfortunately, until now, it's not translated into English. Uh, just into South Korea, you can buy this book, actually. But uh, my publisher is still uh, in progress to uh, uh, find uh, other publishing um, houses in other parts of the world that we get the translation in different languages. But I think the topic is so interesting that I'm uh, started actually to speak about it uh, um, and I like to um, take you in, uh, on a journey uh, to this uh, secret power of colors actually. What uh, is the main intention of the book? I asked myself uh, uh, really a couple of years ago why actually uh, are human beings seeing colors? I think we are using lots of energy actually to to, 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 um, to have the ability to um, perceive color. So guesses uh, say about 60% of our brains, so the whole visual, uh, 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 visual uh, apparatus in our brain is uh, more or less busy with, uh, um, with uh, colors. So uh, it must be something uh, which is so important uh, that we have this ability actually. And there are many, many, um, many, many uh, other uh, living beings, uh, uh, animals and even plants uh, have the ability to communicate through colors. So it's a main communication instrument 
in the whole world, if you look at it. And I like to show you a little bit of my um, insights, actually. So I found out, and I, at the moment, I show you these seven biological and cultural functions of color. So I identified uh, seven really main reasons why human beings and even other uh, living beings see colors and even plants communicate uh, through colors. We have um, these seven functions. It's, I start with orientation, then it's health, of course, it's warning, camouflage, advertising, status, and then it's the color language in the main, um, um, in the main uh, uh, topic. So we start with orientation. In the most colorful areas of the world, it's very interesting because they are uh, living the most species on a very narrow space together. So you see where you need orientation, there are the colorful, uh, the most colorful uh, areas in the world. These are these coral reefs, for example, and you see really millions sometimes of individuals communicating through colors. And I'm not just talking about today about biology, but I show you in each of these circumstances why color in culture using actually the same um, the same uh, reasons to communicate. And it's very interesting if you want to really work methodologically with colors, then um, I think it's really good to have this background using it. Okay, so you see uh, color create identity. And if you have really loads of individuals on a very small space, then the nature is very inventive. And you see these patterns uh, uh, full of colors and you say, okay, uh, nature is really uh, uh, grateful to us, but it all has its reason. So every stripe and every pattern has its reason that, they, that this individual can identify each other and they can orient in a very complex environment. And if you look in this um, human societies, you see color fulfills the same uh, purposes. Color creates identity for each culture of the world ex exactly and for each individual. And it enables us to orientate, orient, uh, take in, in, in very complex environmental situations. And if you look through the world, you could do it for hours exactly. Uh, um, and it really is, it's a lot of fun to, to see this color um, and cultural topic. And you see, the people really use color to orient in complex spaces. And I have sometimes some um, graduates, they invent um, and they research actually this color culture and they see more and more, uh, come more and more deeper into the secrets of this, uh, of this meaning of color in different cultures. So orientation and uh, identification is a really important uh, reason for using colors everywhere in the world. And you can use it uh, from the beginning yeah, as, an or, uh, as an identification um, topic, or you can use it in modern times. Even You see it um, in smartphones, you see it uh, in, um, in corporate uh, identity, you see it in very complex architectural spaces. We use actually color to communicate, to orientate us in very complex spaces, and we use it as a, a topic of identification. Then it's uh, interesting to uh, examine the next um, really uh, interesting um, uh, meaning and uh, effects of colors on a human um, behavior and uh, perception. It's health. Some people thought, okay, these red fruits are maybe the reason why we see colors. They are not really uh, wrong, but it's much more complex. It's not the red. Um, the red color of the fruits, it's much more um, um, actually a color um, in our foot. So if you look through this natural uh, foot, you can really um, uh, eat and drink just using uh, this color of the rainbow as orientation. You see this anthocyanins uh, as a red color uh, in fruits. You see flavonoids, you see carotenoids and chlorophyll and luteins and all these uh, colors 
and your stomach is telling you what is the right food in the right moment actually this would work would work very well if you wouldn't have this industry so we have the food industry with using actually um, colors to um, guide us actually and to make this uh, industrial food for us look quite acceptable and even healthy but it's actually very difficult in germany we use more than 40 different colors artificial colors to actually to color our food and the packages uh, are even more complex so if you want to um, actually if you want to live uh, in a really healthy uh, way then you should just orientate yourself on biological colors and on healthy food and biological food and then your stomach is doing the right thing and this um, industrial uh, uh, way of um, manipulate this uh, biological sense yeah to to find the right food which is healthy for you and which is really good for you then um then you can avoid actually to go in the wrong direction so it's very nice to know about it but if you work with colors you see it's not the only thing uh, in the in the realm of health we uh, see colors we perceive colors to find the right habitat so to find a healthy habitat where we can live in peace and where we can live very healthy and where we feel very well so the color is a very uh, important um, um, indicator actually for for an environment which is good for human people and if you look on our um, closest uh, closest uh, uh, um, the closest animals which are um, the, the chimpanzees you see here and you can see they build actually um, their houses uh, their nests actually in the in the um, in the uh, uh, trees the top of the trees and you can see the sky you can see uh, far uh, uh, away and um, you see there's a huge contrast actually if you if you look at modern architecture and then you see um, the, the the difference actually between um, our, our our wish actually to see yeah, a healthy environment and to live in a healthy environment and this signals that is not very good for us to live in here so we can see it from the outside we don't have to try it out we just take one look and you see it every do you see it uh, uh, on the on the costs yeah this um, is a, a good indicator actually for a healthy environment so our preferred color space looks somehow some very close to this so we want to really uh, be on top yeah, on uh, uh, of, of uh, the environment and we want to look on a healthy uh, nature so even water or blue sky or green uh, plants so this is uh, even uh, from the uh, color research proved that if you look uh, from your window in the garden then it's um, has an health it has a really good impact on your health even if you are in a hospital it's proved that you are uh, recover quicker if you have this view so there must be something some magic um, relationship between um, people and the colors of nature so um if you design actually something you have not always an, an ideal ideal situation so i did a small project just recently to show you for an uh, environment environmental uh, startup and i uh, rented actually this loft there in wuppertal in the um and it was not really it, it didn't really look very healthy and very nice so um this is one of the pictures um i've done before we started this and you can say okay is this the right place for people to work do they feel well do they feel healthy are they engaged and um, if you look at this you say okay maybe not this black and white environment is not the right space so we started actually to translate this environment and added uh, color and uh, work with the light inside and you see color is not just uh, the color of the walls it's the color of the floors it's the color of light so it's the atmosphere actually which transfers the space 
into something new and it looks much more natural, warm and inviting now. You will see a different situation in this space and you see uh, what we've done there with, uh, um, with not a lot of money just to help them actually to create a more livable working space. And you can add even plants. So even plants uh, in um, flats or working spaces are really good uh, 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 medium actually to, to add color to an environment and to make it more livable and to make the people who work there uh, more healthy. You see it in detail. If you look at the surfaces, this was the surface before there was a wallpaper on top and we just removed this wallpaper and had this pure plaster. So it's even less efforts uh, in this architecture way. You just see the pure plaster, uh, not in a really a sophisticated way, just very pure and a little bit of color um, inside and just uh, inside uh, this window and um, these windows. And which is very nice. We experimented with colors to have not um, the effect of a surface color. We added such so little color as possible to have the effect of a light color actually in these windows. And it's really nice in this space that you have these small um, uh, um, amounts of colored lights everywhere. And you can use color actually uh, to um, define some separate spaces within the large space. There's a separate um, meeting space and you see this the color, which is a little bit hide, hiding uh, this big uh, TV there on the wall, which is a dark uh, color of the uh, wall and the dark TV. And you see this uh, furniture inside and all is breathing, breathing the atmosphere uh, of a very really healthy environment. You see this uh, wood we used uh, uh, for the um, interior. And then afterwards, we got this message um, from the, uh, um, the people who worked there. We would like to tell you they wrote how incredible comfortable we feel here in these beautiful rooms. All the visitors are also completely thrilled. In the evenings, we can hardly tear ourselves away. So it's a possible, it's the power of color actually with very few um, very few changes uh, to changes everyday life of people. And my, uh, um, my uh, main interest as a researcher, color researcher, is actually to prove the effect of these changes in the room. I show you afterwards a project and you can measure how uh, people profit actually from this um, color um, design. So it's, um, it's something you can uh, really um, proof that this has an effect of people and a positive effect, and I show you later. First, we go uh, to one very well known um, reason where we see color. It's a warning. So we see there's something dangerous. Don't touch. Don't come too close to these um, colors. And we can uh, see it everywhere in nature, and we use it actually uh, in our culture. Um, as well. So we have the color, as you have the color red, and it's the color of danger. We see it very quickly. Uh, so with this traffic lights, you can really uh, react in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quarter of, an, uh, of a second, and it saves life actually to use, um, to work with these red colors. And we can use it actually to warn um, if there's a, a car driving with a high speed and it's all in us. So these uh, warning colors, uh, more or less, they are there actually because um, they are made yeah, for us. These are the reason why we perceive colors to be warned to, um, to live in a more safer way. You, we can use actually this warning colors uh, to um, to um, to um, uh, use it in sports and other activities where we want the people to look yeah, and to be really thrilled uh, from these events. So it really gives the event more tension and it's more interesting and more emotional actually if we use these warm colors to, uh, uh, for our sport events and other activities. Then becoming to the point four, it's camouflage. 
And camouflage, it's um, even a really um, interesting thing. You can really hide. So if I would uh, like to hide, I can actually um, use a very grayish, um, grayish uh, outfit, for example. I have a photo, maybe I show you. So I could uh, have chosen um, the color gray, actually. I show you at the moment, so you can look. If you want to hide and we uh, and look maybe really uninspired and maybe a bit older and maybe a bit uh, really uh, not very um, uh, uh, um, how can you say and you have no presence actually then you can use the color um, um, gray and if you want to have more presence you can use the color orange and so you can say okay um, there's really an interesting uh, connection between. Um, this uh, different possibilities to to hide, yeah, or to uh, play yourself uh, in the uh, front of an event. So we come back to the camouflage. You see this camouflage uh, in nature. Actually, you see um, camouflage could be everywhere. It could be every color. Yeah. Here you see uh, this lion hiding in the grass. You see uh, people hiding somehow with their gray outfits in the city. And you see uh, people hiding somehow uh, behind these gray suits in the office. And so it's very interesting, even if you design something and you can use um, this biological um, effects of color to hide something or to warn people to put it uh, in front. And it's really working quite well. Coming to point five, it's advertising. If you look at this uh, wonderful male peacock, um, maybe you might wonder why nature is creating uh, uh, um, an animal like this. You can say it's not where it makes not really sense. So if you are, if there is coming, uh, 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 for example, a lion or whatever. It's uh, very, very uh, difficult to hide for this peacock actually from, um, from um, dangers. So why has nature created these beautiful colors? Why are these beautiful colors in the world and this very, very, um, uh, um, very, very beautiful um, inventions? Um, if you look at this peacock, you can count, actually scientists counted um, these eyes of the peacock's tail, and they found actually a relationship, a relationship between um, the um, the youngest, um, the, the 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 children every uh, of the peacock, and this chances actually to to uh, stay alive in the first year after birth. So the female actually peacocks can orient uh, on this uh, very beautiful. Um, uh, very beautiful colors and find which are the most um, or the best and the healthiest genes uh, of this animal. So it's a sign actually of this positive and healthy genes. You have a genetic uh, uh, um, indicator actually uh, with these beautiful colors. Um, other um, animals uh, do it in a more complex way even to, to use beauty to stay alive and to have healthy um, succeeders. You see um, this bird actually, and it's really a beautiful bird. He has beautiful uh, um, colors and do, it's doing a beautiful dance and it's singing really well, but he's doing one thing which is uh, even more interesting. He's decorating actually uh, his places with um, flowers and uh, with fruits and he's arranging it into different um, different geometrical forms. So you can say it's the first, um, maybe, or the most impressive um, animal who is using color actually to impress yeah, his female um, counterparts uh, to um, have, uh, uh, yeah, to, to find um, this couple. And you could ask, maybe, if you look at this, you could ask yourself, if beauty yeah, is uh, uh, working like this, why do we have so many beautiful um, living beings in the world? Even with uh, human beings, there's not one 
definition of beauty, of color beauty. So there are many different um, definitions. What is uh, beautiful? So if I make tests with uh, people and I do it in a workshop, maybe uh, mostly as the first um, thing, I find out this idea of beauty of the people and they really impressed because everyone has a different idea of beauty. And if you look why, yeah, what could be the biological reasons for our individual ideas of beauty and these really um, different uh, perceptions of uh, beauty with uh, connection with colors, then you see it in this, um, that you, you see um, these um, fishes, for example. Scientists found out that you have not just color preferences uh, with the male individual, with the female, you have color genes. And these genes, they, they have color preferences. The female, maybe uh, they prefer blue and the male, they produce blue. Yeah? And another female, uh, they produce color pro preference for green and the females, they are females who produce green. And so you, so you can go on and you see, okay, it's communication. There is somebody yeah, who finds something beautiful like these females and others who have to produce these colors which others find beautiful to stay alive, to um, have healthy um, um, children or predecessors actually. So it's quite interesting. You see this diversity in, uh, in, in beauty. It has really um, a biological purpose to have this, um, this wide uh, range uh, actually of, of, um, of a species actually to, to find um, these niches uh, in these biological systems that they um, spread over the world and stay alive. And if you look a bit um, in our uh, cultural society, you see, okay, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's more or less not just that we have different genes, different um, color preferences from birth, that's true. Um, people are different and they have different color preferences from birth. Uh, but we have socialization actually as a, a main influence on our color preferences. And you see some people find it really beautiful to see this uh, ballroom of Kas in, in Kashrin Place at St. Petersburg and others prefer this pure bow style. So it's different what you um, maybe uh, regard as beauty. It is... Um, but it's, uh, you can find out what is the reason. It's not um, mysterium, it's um, you can find an explanation. Okay, we coming to the sixth point from seven, to the status. You see this um, peacock, you see this um, really um, nice uh, peacock and you see um, when, yeah, this, um, this, uh, um, this uh, peacock is um, getting old or maybe um, unhealthy, then he loses its color and other come and want his position. So they start fighting. And if you lose actually your power, yeah, you see it on the color and these um, peacocks start to fight and the winner actually, the winner change its Color. So it's really interesting actually the process. So the color within this society, it gives you status and the biology has prepared actually to change the colors of the, of the, um, of the uh, individual, which is a new leader of this, um, of this chicken uh, fork uh, to um, have the most, um, uh, 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 can I say the most uh, impressing uh, colors and to have the highest status within um, this um, chicken fork. And you see in uh, human societies, you have more or less same thing. You can see from the colors, is it upper class or if it's an underclass environment or if the people coming from upper class or underclass, you see it in all the societies, but you see it in our societies as well. And there's another a point of research or NASA uh, uh, um, special, uh, for me, NASA, uh, um, can you say, uh, main topic of research. 
uh, it's uh, to find um, this uh, social status and basic orientation of people and bring it in uh, connection with color. So you see the Sinus milieus in Germany, you see first um, the social status, so lower, middle and higher, and then, then you see the basic values from tradition going to, um, to exploration and reorientation. You see really um, a lot of different groups which are differentiated from their social cultural status actually. And then I ask people actually to empty their wardrobe and bring everything and then the, uh, make a guess. I even could do it with you, but we have no time today because it's just a short color talk today. But then I ask people actually to arrange their whole wardrobe in these circles. And then I ask other people after I informed them about um, these signers milieus, uh, just to guess from which milieu um, this person might come. Yeah. And I've done it hundreds of times and people can guess really exactly uh, from which social cultural milieu you come. They just look at this color circle and you can, uh, they can, uh, um, they can uh, guess which milieu it might be. Um, another thing to make it clear what I'm talking about, this is an experiment I've done um, uh, with students, we examined uh, about uh, uh, between 30 or 40 different social cultural milieus in one city. And uh, the students have done hundreds of pictures, like here in the kindergarten in the more healthy area of the town. And you see, it's really colorful, actually. If you see it as children, it's like you imagine um, uh, a positive and um, a real good childhood. And if you look at these colors, you can do same thing in a completely different area. You can uh, take these photos and you can make then afterwards an average. I show you here, you have these hundreds of photos. We fed them in a computer and we got this color fingerprints you see in the back behind me. If you look at this color fingerprint, you see it looks really uh, not very colorful and a bit brownish, a bit grayish. And if you compare it with the kindergarten I've shown you before, so you see um, the more problematic area. I put myself a bit uh, from the stage. And then you see the kindergarten and you can see even in complex environments, there you can read the social cultural status of, um, of uh, um, people yeah, or of, of environments from the colors. So it's really a main difference between um, colors uh, in, a, uh, um, in this different cultural um, areas of, um, of a town, for example. We, we've done it actually with um, 30 or 33, I think it was 33 different milieus. And each of this has a um, typical color fingerprint. So it's not just between poor and rich, it's even uh, between people who do craftsmanship or people who are intellectuals and so on, you have always different color fingerprints. Okay, this was status. I come to the last um, last biological um, reason why we see color and why we design with color. It's color language. And then afterwards, uh, in the end, I give you an example, actually. Color language is... Um, really nice theme because then uh, if you talk uh, about color language, then it becomes really complex. You see this chameleon actually changing the color and uh, a long time we just uh, thought maybe they use it to hide. Or uh, then afterwards, some people thought uh, maybe they use it to warn other people, uh, other, other, um, other animals uh, not uh, to, to attack them. And it's much more complex, actually. They change, actually, the colors to talk with another. So maybe um, if some individual looks, yeah, a male individual looks for a female, then it's asking changing colors. Um, do you like uh, maybe um, to be uh, um, my friend, to be a couple with me or to, to um, whatever? And the females answering actually changing the color and say yes or no and if the female is pregnant it's changing the colors and the, the male knows exactly okay it makes no sense 
to ask this female and so on. So sometimes uh, they do this color, um, this color uh, changing so quickly within our, uh, uh, um, within our, uh, uh, under a second. So it's in a time slot under a second. So we can really not perceive it with our eyes. So you need special cameras actually to see this color language, this color communication from this um, individual. So they have much better eyes. They see many more colors and they see a completely more complex way, a world than human beings. They have this false color receptor and see millions more colors in the world. So we are not um, uh, um, on the highest point of the, of the color evolution. There are many more uh, animals in the world uh, who are um, com uh, have a communication system which is more complex than ours. But what's interesting actually, that we have a whole color culture where you can show um, how we communicate with colors. I show you uh, in my book, I have it for 13 psychological basic colors. So I'm not talking about why I have 13 psychological basic colors. You just have to believe me at the moment that I worked out that something like this might exist. I show you one example, how I defined one psychological color and how I defined um, the meaning of it and the symbol uh, value of this color. We start with black. We have here this, um, I called it color brain map. So it's, uh, I, I've collected hundreds, thousands of pictures with my students together. And then we try to fit it in the computer and to work out which meanings has a color. So where we see color, where we perceive this color and what might a color uh, be for us uh, and what might the color tell us actually. And I show you for black, for example. So each color has very, very different meanings. So it makes no sense, sense actually if somebody asked me, yeah, what color should I maybe wear if I go um, and, um, and uh, make a good impression maybe uh, uh, to find um, a new working uh, place. I say, it's not so easy. So color can have very different meanings, but it's not, um, it's not, uh, you can understand it. So it's, it's not um, um, accidentally. It's everything uh, we do with colors has a purpose and has a reason. So we use uh, black, for example, you have uh, four different compartments in this um, color brain map. One I called night black, then velvet black, masquerade black and phantom black. We take a very, very short look at this uh, um, color brain maps. I could have a lecture for each of these maps because it's really interesting to see it. So night black, it, of course, it comes from this uh, natural phenomenon, uh, the blackness of the night. You, you, you feel threatening, you have this evil meaning and this melancholic actually feeling you have in the night when your um, hormones uh, go in a certain um, balance and you have this um, uh, lack of serotonin and even uh, um, other um, physical impacts and you feel a bit more um, anxious, a bit more melancholic actually in the night. And if you look uh, how we work with colors, you see you have this meaning, exactly this meaning. You have this terror, terror uh, uh, um, brigades of the Islamic State. You have um, even for the, with the Nazis, you have this SS uh, using black, you have this anarchic people using black, and you have on the, on the other hand, you have um, this uh, connection with death, actually, dude, with death. So, uh, with death, you have uh, Ed Reinhardt, for example, it's a very uh, well named painter. He um, used to paint black paintings just before he died. So, he changed actually this color palette to this more black paintings. And you can find actually this, this habit uh, in the many, uh, um, many uh, works of very well-named um, artists. Then we go to the velvet black. It's, a ne it's the next uh, compartment. Um, it's uh, this black, the dramatic, the pathetic, and uh, this elitistic uh, black, you use it in the theater, you use it on the stage, and it's use it with the black um, suit 
Um, it's very, very uh, status color, and you can use it even uh, for em emancipation. The, 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 um, the women like Coco Chanel or Audrey Hepburn, they used it actually to, um, to claim that women are, women want to have the same rights than men. So they use the status color black actually to say, okay, we are on the same level and we want the same rights. So it's quite interesting to see the status color and you see um, the phantom black, it's the, ne the next thing. This phantom black you see, for example, here um, in this Kaaba, you see it's very mysterious. It's the night, you don't know what's behind it. It's mysterious. You can't speak about it, but you can grasp it. So if you wanna um, speak about things, you have no words, then you can use black. You just have a black uh, obelisk, for example, in Odyssey in space uh, from Stanley Kubrick. You have this black cover, actually. There is something, there is a principle you can uh, perceive it's black, but you can't speak about it. You have no pictures about it. So it's this mysterious um, color. You can use it um, as this black matching, like you see here in Hitchcock's uh, a movie, for example, with these black birds. So you don't know why, but they get uh, they got mad and really attacked people. Or you see it in existentialism uh, for artists and intellectuals. Uh, you see it's a, a color to have a mysterious and a bit a very interesting um, atmosphere around you. Okay, we're coming to the last uh, um, to the last. Uh, um, uh, part of this uh, um, black analysis, you see this masquerade black. Actually, you see this inapproachable. You, if you want, if you want, if you don't want to come in contact with people, if you want to draw back from uh, from civilization and from um, everyday life, you can use black. You have a distance. If you wear black clothes, you have a distance to um, your. Um, you to to your um, to other human beings. It's a protective uh, color. So if you uh, want to feel protected, you can use black. And it's quite interesting to see how people use these colors. You see, uh, it's not just with this Christian religion. You see it even um, here. Uh, this woman with the burkas, or you see very cool outfits from our uh, young people today. So they all they all want to hide. They want to have a distance uh, to other people with this um, black um, clothes, and it works quite well. So if I would uh, change my clothes today, and if I would uh, give my lecture actually in an outfit like this, I just prepared it with a um, photograph, you see it here, and you see a huge difference. So if I use um, a smart color like this pink to give my lecture today, it's qu completely different as then I would, uh, uh, then you would perceive the whole speak if I would uh, come and, and do the same thing in a black outfit. So it's quite interesting how the color of your clothes or the color of an environment changes the way how a people will be perceived or how the talk uh, of people will be perceived. So if you um, have to, uh, I, in the end of this, um, I have to sum up. You see these 13 um, different um, psychological colors. So it's the basic colors from a different view. And um, it's quite interesting actually the way how I found out what are our 13 um, uh, psychological basic colors, but it's not the time uh, to speak about today because I want to, um, speak about one project or maybe two. I will see if the time um, will um, make it possible actually to speak about one or two projects. So I'm talking about um, the way how color is changing our behavior. What you've seen until now is color meaning, color symbolism. So color, of course, it's a symbol. It has meaning. Of course, you have seen it in a very short, um, short um, lecture, but we have an impact because it's not that color communication is, is just done if you transport a meaning. Color communication has an intention. It wants to change behavior. That's the reason. And you see, 
If you look at the human brain, you see that the transport from the visual cortex of the color signals, it's going to semantic memory um, areas of the brain. They is, it's called the what stream of the color signals. So what is to see its color meaning, but we have the same very, very strong um, stream in our brain. It's going to um, a different, um, a different area of our brain. It's uh, the behavioral memory. And you see, it's how we always ask, how should we react? How is reacting something and how should we prepare uh, on what we see? I give you an example uh, with one project I've done um, in um, a hospital in um, Wuppertal, in my new hometown here. I've done it with um, my university and uh, with uh, Dr. Webker. He's the chief, um, um, the chief um, in a, a station of intensive care. And uh, I called it healing atmosphere. And I want to show you how color is changing, not just the perception and the feeling of people, but even the behavior and the life of people. We've done it in four different intensive care units. Um, and I show you examples just from one of the project. It's an intensive care medicine unit with 15 patient rooms and 21 beds. And it's together, it's the largest study which is done uh, until now in the whole world. So it's really, very, very interesting because we found out a lot of things which are even very surprising for us. Um, the first thing I asked myself um, entering this, um, this uh, intensive care unit was, where do you feel comfortable, alive and healthy? What must be the atmosphere actually where you feel like this? So if you're uh, in, in this um, condition yeah, that you need intensive care, then maybe you need an atmosphere like this. But what you find if you, if you enter actually the station, you find the opposite. Yeah? You have uh, an atmosphere which is completely white. You have an atmosphere which is um, really, really cold. You have this uh, it really um, uh, supporting feelings like fear, supporting feelings like anonymity, or even have the whole atmosphere of carelessness. If you look, um, then there are windows. It's not really nice what you see if you look out of the windows, but the people are not able actually to look out of the windows. What the people see if they look even in the last days of their life is this, this sailing, yeah. This, this is the, the thing when you're feeling really bad, yeah? when, you have, uh, when you fight for your life. This is the last impression or is the impression you see, you perceive, uh, and it can't be good for your health. It can't be good for the medical purpose. And so we try to change actually this atmosphere. And then we research what is the impact on the people there. So this atmosphere you had before we started our project, so it caused uh, many, many delusions, hallucinations and depressions, actually. The people feel depressed, they looked at this and um, because uh, the, the school medicine, they had an answer, it's no problem, they said, okay, we use neuroleptics. So it's a very strong medicine. And if you look at this, um, it uh, has um, a significant increase in mortality if you give this um, medicine to people and um, they stay longer in the hospital and some of them die even earlier. So it's not really easy just to use, uh, to find a solution um, to um, feed the people uh, with pills. So we said, okay, maybe a different environment might decrease the level of um, this um, neuroleptics in this station. And we try to find out. So we um, ask ourselves um, a, a real lot of questions. I just brought three of them uh, to the lecture today. Which impact has the design of color and light in intensive care units on the well-being and the health status of the patients? We asked it in many, many more details, but this is the uh, it's it's um, the main question. Then we had the second question where we looked on the stuff and we said, okay, 
they have this really, really, really um, exhausting work. They work in yeah, 24 hours uh, all day long and people dying and people suffering. And it's really, really hard to work there. And they find not really people who want to do this job. So it's really difficult actually to find um, people who want to do it. So we asked the second question actually there, which impact has the design of color and light in intensive care units on the motivation, behavior, and well-being of the medical and nursing staff? So it was the second important question. So the patients and the staff. And you see, then we changed not the whole station, not, not the floors and not the furniture, just the colors of the walls and the the little bit the colors of the same. You just painted the ceilings in a different type of white, not this cold white. It's a bit more warm white. And we changed actually the light conditions. So it was a different light than before. So we improved the orientation. You see this colored um, marks there on the long, long floor, which has a, um, like now at the moment, you have this, um, uh, this color, um, uh, this color, color, um, how can you say? harmony for example or this even the, the, the floor is structured it's not so long anymore it's more uh, vivid it's more uh, lively actually and you have a better orientation to find the spaces and every room every patient room got an own color so it's to um to um to uh, show the individuality of the people who are in these spaces actually then uh, we, trans, uh, we, we, we changed the colors of the space. You see before and after it's more tranquil um, atmosphere and there's a more stimulating atmosphere. And uh, we um, changed the colors of the stuff um, room uh, where they can regenerate a bit better. And what's important there is that you, um, that you um, uh, have a completely different atmosphere, even different to the patient rooms that they can there make their break. So if you have the same atmosphere um, than before, everywhere the same at the moment that uh, before we started the project, there was the same atmosphere in every room. So if you work hard, if the, if the people suffering there, then you want to make your break. You can't really start to regenerate because you, 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 um, you um, have this, the, the full problems in your mind. And so it's very important, like a movie, where you have a section from a very depressive um, atmosphere to a very brightful atmosphere for the for the people for the staff we had a change in atmosphere so completely different atmosphere than before and they uh, told us afterwards it works they go there and they start the break in the moment they open the door okay you see the emotional effects of flight so you see here on this picture, it's a simulating of the picture. You see the fluorescent light we had before, and we changed the bulbs actually to warm white LED light. And you see uh, the people look more um, healthy and a bit more empathic actually, which is very important. And maybe it's an explanation that the people feel even um, the care much better um, in this hospital now. So you can change the color rendering index and the color temperature. You see the sleep and wake rhythm of the light. You can uh, work even with cold or warm light and we, to change the atmosphere between the floors, the public spaces and um, the, uh, uh, the places where people have to stay. And then afterwards, we try to evaluate actually the results, uh, what changed in these spaces and what changed in the perception of the people and behavior of the people and the hard facts like the uh, drug consumption, so the, uh, the pills and, um, and um, the days, uh, who's, uh, the, days uh, the stuff is ill in the year. So you see uh, the first uh, evaluation of the patients, you see um, they find um, the stuff um, appreciative more or less like before and competent it changed not a lot it improved a little bit just about 15 percent but the staff um, they perceived um, the nurses and the medical staff much more calm so the atmosphere was calm and the people um, they they were not so in stress so they they, they, they uh, had a completely different impression um, they um, say okay they have time yeah, 
for me. They take themselves time to care for me. They are calmer than before. They're not in stress and they don't want to go to the next bed or to the next room. They are here for me. And this is a very good change of the atmosphere, the effect of the change atmosphere in the space. Then we see um, actually the um, uh, results of the patients. We ask them, uh, how do you evaluate the design of the unit? And there you see um, a really huge um, change than before. Um, if you um, see, uh, for example, the, the space, you see rejecting or inviting, it changed from 3.2 um, to 1.6, from bad to very good. Inspiring or boring from 3.8 to 1.7, warm or cold. And you can go on and you see it's almost 50%, it's 44% in the overall average um, that we change just transferring the uh, colors of the walls and the sailing, uh, the atmosphere and the space. And this is the main factor of designing a space. And it's quite interesting, a modern architecture the architects do not this job. They stop. They're just defining the space to the walls and they stop actually. And the color is not a real, um, um, a real uh, business of the most architects to design their spaces until um, the last detail actually. But you see, it's important not to stop there, even to go further. Then we ask the stuff. How satisfied are you with um, your work, for example? Because if it's very difficult to find stuff for these um, hospitals, then maybe you can change something. You give them a warmer and more welcoming atmosphere. And we ask them and they say, how satisfied are you with your work? We go from 3.7 to 2.4. And how satisfied are you with your employee? We go from 4.2, so very bad rates to 2.7. So you see um, the impact of color and we never ask if you like the color, this is forbidden. We ask everything else, but not if they like the color and never ask um, if you like, if somebody likes the color because then we go in the realm of aesthetics of beauty. And I told you before, everyone has a different idea of what's the beauty for color. And there you find no solution where everyone is satisfied. We want to change this actually criteria. And we do, uh, we did the same with, uh, we asked the staff about uh, the design of the station and we got really astonishing results. So um, we asked uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the, the rooms and uh, different light quality and so on. And we got more than 52 point um, race yeah, in the in the in the evaluate, evaluation of the design of the station, just to change the colors there. So it makes a huge difference actually for each um, design criteria to find the right colors. And in the end, I show you there is um, um, the most um, astonishing results. So uh, for the school of medicine, it was very important that we find empirical data, actually not just asking people and comparing afterwards and forth and have interviews, we use these hard facts. And so we ask which impact had the different environment uh, on the health of the staff there. And we found out that uh, um, the, the rate you know, of hell of, of ill people, the, the, the rate um, sank from 8.17 to 5.28% of the staff, which was ill during the time of a year. Now we have 35.73% more healthy um, staff there who, are, who is not just feeling better, but who is um, available for work, which is a really interesting um, result. And the last uh, and most astonishing one was that you had a, a reduction of drug consumption. This neuroleptics I spoke uh, in the beginning. It has uh, um, um, now we um, have a reduction of 30% of these special drugs in these stations. And this is something which even impressed the school of medicines. And now it's, dis it, it's discussed in Germany 
want many uh, congresses there with many, uh, uh, and they try maybe even to change the whole hospital landscape of Germany. So I had really huge um, uh, uh, um, uh, questions from, from uh, these areas actually, how yeah, can we use this? How can we control this? How can we repeat this uh, whole thing? And now we are in the process of repeating actually the experiment in different settings. Now we're doing a different station for demand people, for, uh, uh, for children and for lots of different purposes to find out more data uh, which impact has color on human beings, on their behavior, on their perception and on their emotions. Okay, this is more or less the last slide. I'm ready with my presentation. I have a different project even with this, but I think um, the time's over. I should stop here. And if you have questions, you can ask me now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Axel, this was really very, very interesting presentation. I really wish, I'm, and I'm sure I'm not alone, that we could listen to it much longer. Ines, I think you will moderate the questions. Ines, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, yeah, there were some questions coming in. Uh, the first one was from Janet. Uh, she wanted to know uh, the comparison about smell and color in food. What is your idea about this? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's uh, actually a part of a different lecture actually to, to see how we learn the meaning of color. And of course, it's a multi-central experience. So you can even change yeah, the smell with using colors and you can even change the color perception with different smells. So if you have a smell of a cheese in the space and you show people a yellow, they maybe they don't like this yellow. If you have a smell of a beautiful flower, for example, uh, with the same color, the people like this yellow tone. So it's a, actually, it's an interdependence between all our senses. And it's quite interesting how you can change actually um, a smell with colors and how you can change a color perception with using different smells actually. And if you, search for a nice color tone. I, I, I haven't shown you the project uh, I've done for Villeroy and Boch, actually. There we used actually the topic of smell and touch and, 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 and taste actually to define nice colors. So I'm not uh, spoke about how you find the right colors, how you find nice colors for the different purposes. And smell, I think it's really important uh, to define the slight differences within a color tone. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, there was another question, uh, and I think many people want to know, are from Chris Beck, this one, are the 13 brain maps available somewhere to work with the research values? Yeah, actually the problem, <laughs> the brain maps are actually in this book. Um, uh, this book. All right. Um, but this book is uh, you can you can actually um, you can actually have it even as a, an ebook, um, but it's just in German at the moment um, there and it's not. Uh, but I hope maybe this year, maybe next year, that we have an English translation and um, you can uh, look at this and even how uh, we work to 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 produce this color uh, brain maps and how uh, maybe the whole thing, the whole process could uh, uh, reproduce in a different cultural area because. This um, 13 um, psychological basic colors, they might be different in different parts of the world. So I described the process, how I found it, so that somebody else can repeat it and say, maybe in Australia or maybe um, in Nicaragua or wherever, we have different results and then you have different colors. So my intention is that you have not just one guy who says, these are the basic colors, so you have a process. This is good science for me. And you say, this uh, is my way to have these results. And this is the way I got this, um, I got this uh, color brain maps. I thought about having an internet site, uh, maybe an app or whatever, to have all these, uh, all these meanings and maybe allow people to add and work on this uh, huge uh, uh, brain maps, color brain maps. This would be very interesting. Maybe you could even see differences of different uh, a cult, uh, different cultural impacts. But at the moment, it's just 
in the book, you can see it and maybe you can translate it if you have an ebook or whatever, but it's not available in, um, in English, unfortunately. Okay. Um, a question I want to ask is, uh, you, you are defining 13 basic uh, groups of meaning. But what about what's, what happens when, with the meaning when you combine colors? Did you have any research on that? Yes. That's something I, 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 um, I'm talking about in the book as well, um, how you can use it. So you are right. It's just one thing to define meaning of one singular color. And it's really complex because it's not one color. It's always a color category. And within the color category green, you have about uh, hundreds of thousands of different shades. So um, you can even combine these different shades with other colors. Mm -hmm. And But if you have an idea how our memory is working, then you see it's the power of color is the power of association. And if you, you can combine different color meanings and can say, okay, I can combine different color association and you can prove it if you perceive yeah, the right association, you can really work it and, and you can uh, experiment with colors and can say, okay, maybe I want to create a healthy atmosphere. So you can say, I, maybe I, I find some healthy color tones, maybe for example, or color shades. Yeah, then I try to compare and look if, if it's in this context, yeah, if it looks more healthy or maybe it's too much, it's, it's, uh, or maybe I just need one. Yeah, maybe I need the second one. Maybe I need uh, a bit more uh, reduced color on the wall and one very fresh color in the front, maybe a vivid orange or vivid yellow in the, in the front. And then it looks more healthy and looks more uh, that and that. So you can make experience, you perceive it. So um, your, your, your eyes, your perception is connected with your brain and you have always um, this loop. You can experiment, you can perceive and can say, okay, if I have this basic orientation I give you with my uh, color brain maps, then I can combine colors and can control if they go in the right direction, if it's a stronger effect or if the effect, effect is reducing. All right. Um, yeah, somebody uh, proposes or it's, it's a question, but uh, uh, with the patients that's yeah uh, with the patients facing the ceiling how about having light shows on the ceiling which can be projected showing the patient's favorite places and people uh, would that be uh, a good idea yes um we just um lifted the carpet i think one corner of the carpet actually to a realm of how we can measure actually and control uh, color effects and of course, there are uh, many um, experiments in the world. I have seen such thing uh, in the Charité in Berlin. They actually, they use uh, different uh, uh, light screens on the sailing with um, a diffu diffusing uh, uh, colors there and uh, try to have this more vivid impact of color, which is a bit more because nature is not, uh, it's not uh, frozen. It's uh, a little bit in, in, in movement. And you can, with, with light, you can give this impression of movement, maybe a slow, slow wind uh, going through leaves or what, whatever in your brain is happening, if you look at this. Yeah. And you can, maybe I, I heard even uh, that it's possible if you use it for dentists. So you see uh, you are in a dentist, care, uh, a dentist chair, and then you look at the sailing and maybe it helps you even as a, a certain kind of hypnosis um, to, um, to um, avoid actually um, to avoid actually to, to, um, to have this heavy uh, uh, medicine every to, to um, uh, um, do the work of the dentist. I don't know the word at the moment yeah. to, to um, what is it? Just if, you're, if a dentist uses its, its, uh, its needles and, and it, it uses these drugs and you can maybe reduce this drug using uh, images and, and yeah, try to right. find uh -huh. a more relaxing, um, uh, relaxing impression. It works, actually I've shown an example of it, but we have to find more um, about the reason and we have to find more data about how it works and that it works. Okay. But it's not a good, um, a good solution for every space actually you have to be very careful so people often ask me 
okay, can I have your colors from the intensive care unit and I put it everywhere as in, in the hospital? Yeah. I think, no, it's not possible. You can't even do it in another hospital, in an, another intensive care unit yeah. in Australia or wherever. It's not the colors you should copy. You should copy the method. Yeah. And you should find your own colors, actually. So I'm not on the way to define the best colors for hospitals. I'm on the way to define a method which you could use for every purpose to control colors, to convince actually your client that it makes sense that he maybe have um, uh, a more uh, um, well-being uh, um, for his stuff or whatever, or he's selling his products uh, much better or whatever purpose he might have in mind. Um, I try to define a method and this method has to be applied on different contexts and then that's it. Okay, um, there was one a question from Pussy uh, regarding the hospital room setting. Do you think the excitement of having a newly constructed colored rooms might have affected the results of before after impression of employees? Yeah, of course. Um, I think uh, there are many indicators actually would change uh, the perception um, of, of, of uh, the patient. And of course, we have to repeat it. And I'm in the process of repeating actually the process um, in different uh, situations and to find out um, what uh, yeah, uh, the different, uh, um, the different uh, um, main factors, the different effects actually to have this result. You are perfectly right. And I think this is good science. I just make it transparent what I've done and other scientists or other designers and, and uh, should maybe work and to find out more, to give more information, to, to vary actually this experiments and to find out more. I think, um, of course, there are different uh, explanations for different um, effects, but what is astonishing, I've done it now in different contexts for different situations and you find out it has, you find out it has an um, it, it has an uh, impact on each situation and we have to work with it very carefully because you have even negative impacts you can make it uh, uh, you can uh, create a, a more um, or can you say a more confusing atmosphere for example or whatever or you can uh, rise um, the factor that it's more loud than before so for us it's a, it's it's very very uh, uh, sophisticated actually to work with this and um, don't take this, what I've told you today, as, um, as the last words. I think these are the first words which are opening up a process um, everyone can um, be a part of and, and try to, to maybe to, to uh, bring this color psychology on a new level in, in society. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, there's a question from Vincian Lacra. Most of your categories are in fact used, except white, gray, black. Have you investigated in another way, high saturated, low saturated, medium saturated colors? Um, I didn't get the question actually, I just- Well, uh, she's asking, uh, how about saturation? Did you uh, research this, um, this tool, this uh, quality of color, saturation? Yeah, actually this is one of the main practical things we have to do. So first we do, um, if you have the process actually uh, uh, doing a project, then we have first a workshop where we work with all uh, the knowledge, all the people who have knowledge about uh, this, uh, this project. So I try to do it in a participative way. Um, the second step is actually um, that, that I define then afterwards, uh, what impacts uh, uh, should I create there? What is the atmosphere, for example, and what should uh, I improve? So color for me, it's an, enver it's, it's an environmental, um, environmental uh, factor. It's an random environmental um, impact on people. And I can support something which happen in the space. So I have to know first what I have to support. So I have a list with, um, with uh, words and with descriptions which I, what, what I can support yeah, for a product okay. different than for a space. And then comes actually um, that I have to find the right colors. And afterwards I can uh, evaluate if these um, if this, um, things I want to support are really happened. So I find then on the, on the place, I find the right shades actually 
uh, with uh, my own color experience or the color experience of um, my stuff. So we looked at this and say, okay, maybe yeah, we have to, to lower the level of uh, saturation actually to lower the effect of this color maybe. And then you have to go like you have a, uh, there, uh, a switch and you can go and different, 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 different and say, okay, maybe it's okay. So then we have this um, on in theory, we have, this, uh, we have this color concept and then I go there and make Excel actually um, samples. Yeah, this is very important that you have these samples and I go again and say, okay, maybe it's too much. Maybe it's I have a bit stronger impact. And then I find the shade, it's a process. It's really like dancing. You have a little bit more, a little bit uh, less and so on. And I never made it that I go maybe to a space and say, I have these uh, color samples on the walls and I say, it's everything perfect. Last, uh, last time, uh, last Monday, I, I went in a therapy, a children's therapy station we've done. And we had uh, about 30 color samples on the wall. I changed every sample. I have experienced 30 years experience with colors. I had to change 30 colors again. Yeah, you can't really guess it. This shade, and we uh, theoretically, you have to see it. You have to see it in space, in the context, right. and then um, you can define. Even with the tiles I've done, I've done for Villeroy and Boch, you have these tiles. You have to produce materials, and it's changing completely with the material surface. That's something you have to do. You need a lot of experience, and you need uh, the material samples. Yeah. yeah. In the right line. Hey, uh, I think uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, positive reactions to your uh, presentation, Axel, uh, and also a few people mentioned that they are doing uh, in a way the same research. And um, somebody asks if they could contact you <clears throat> through email, or do you have an email address that people can get in contact with you, or? Yes, yeah. that's possible. So unfortunately, I just have to concentrate on the talk today. I can't read the chat at the same time. So no, if I not. read the chat, then I can't answer your question. So I would ask everyone who's interested actually to, to come in contact, to send me an email. You find the email in the internet, or maybe you post it uh, in, in the ECI Belgium on the website. So if you like to ask me something, or I, I I've seen uh, in, in, the, in the corner of the eye that somebody is doing a project, maybe a similar project in Australia. I've seen, um, I'm very interested actually if you do a similar project and have results like this uh, to come in contact with you. Because if you have a network of people uh, researching on the same thing uh, on different parts of the world, mm -hmm. um, it's much stronger impact actually as, as if you do it alone. So if you um, want to come in contact, just uh, don't hesitate, send me an email. All right. Uh, the let me the the uh, website um, that you have uh, is also mentioned uh, on our website where the the news uh, where the your, your presentation is announced. We have a link there. Is that a link to your website where they can contact you? Yeah, I think so. It should work. All right. Yeah, okay. you can use this link, and on my website you can see. Uh, the email address and it's i think it's not 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 very difficult actually to get the email address in the web right yeah Peter at you uh, at uh, university uh, uni minus uh, wuppertal.de so uh, university minus uh, wuppertal.de but you can find it uh, um, everywhere i think in the internet all right okay okay Right, uh, it was very great, uh, your talk, uh, lots of positive reactions. Uh, I give the word now to Maya. Yes, thank you. Uh, just by the way, I posted uh, uh, Axel's website in the, in the chat. So through that, you can, you can get his contact information on the, on the website and you can contact him. If you have any problem, send us an email and, and we'll connect you together. Um, so, this is actually our last color talk before the summer break. And our next color talk will take place in October. Our speaker will be Nick Harkness, who will introduce his color made simple online courses that are designed to teach the fundamentals of visual color assessment and instrumental color measurements for design uh, industry and research. 
Uh, and for those in Belgium, in September, we are organizing the studio visit and meeting with the artist Philippe Leblanc in Brussels. We will be posting more details on our website soon. Also, you will get all the info in our newsletters. So thanks a lot, Axel, for this wonderful presentation. We could really, really <laughs> listen to it more. I hope we will have another chance. And thanks, everybody, for attending today. Uh, we hope to see you again in the autumn. And I can just say that we have still a little bit of time for a chat, if you have uh, some extra time, but we will be stopping the recording now. Uh, so